Welcome to today's webinar, Embezzlement, False Claims, Theft, and Bribery, NSF OIG Investigated Cases Your Institution Needs to Know About, sponsored by Encura. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. In 1989, Paul Coleman became the first criminal investigator for NSF OIG. Paul later served as the NSF OIG Special Agent in Charge and the Assistant Inspector General for Investigations. During 2002, Paul coordinated the DOD OIG reviews of biochemical laboratories with the FBI anthrax investigation. Paul currently serves as a senior special agent for NSF OIG, conducting complex fraud investigations and coordinating multi-agency fraud issues. Paul is a BA from the University of Maryland and an MA in criminal justice from the George Washington University. Paul is a certified fraud examiner. Charlene Blevins is the Assistant Vice President for Research Accounting at Florida International University. She's worked in the financial area in both the public and private sector in various capacities for more than 24 years, with more than 12 years' experience at state universities in research. She has presented at the INCURA, FRA, SRA, and NACA conferences. In addition, she's the author of the Summary of University Audits, Settlements, and Investigations, located on the Cost Accounting Listserv at www.costaccounting.org. Charlene, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to everybody out there. I see a lot of my friends and colleagues, and thank you for joining us today. Um, Paul and I are going to look at some of the recent frauds that have made the headlines. And I'm going to have Paul say a quick hello so you can tell which is Paul, Paul's voice and which is my voice. Hello. I hope everybody is doing fine. I think you can tell the difference between Charlene and myself. So, um, so we're going to look. We selected some cases, and um, there are, unfortunately, a lot of frauds out there, so we can't cover them all. But we looked. We try to get a good cross section of the cases to go over with you today. And I always feel that uh, you know, looking at these cases and, and understanding what happened, what motivates people to commit fraud, and how it occurred, helps us at our institutions as we assess risk, as we try to implement some preventive measures and as we do our policies and procedures. Um, feel free to ask questions today, and after the webinar, if you have further questions, feel free to talk to us. Um, so one of the things that we're going to talk about are some of the consequences of fraud. And so some of these can be quite severe for the, severe for the institution. So, and we have the financial consequence and if you look at some, you know, some of the settlements we've seen are upward of the uh, 44,000 FIU. We had an $11.5 million uh, fraud settlement. These are astronomical numbers. And so it harms the institution that they have to forego costs, other things they may want to invest their funds in, other things they need to do, or at times you may have to borrow money to be able to, to do it. So there's a severe financial consequence. As we look at the frauds, we're going to see it's not only return of grant funds, but there's also fines and penalties. And at times, we have treble damages. Um, in one of the cases we're going to look at today with EL, the punitive damages were half of what the settlement was. So they paid back the grant funds, and then, they, again, they had to pay half to in punitive damages. Yeah. And the cost... There's something else to think of is the cost to your institution and the time lost, the administrative costs of your people just having to pull all the financial documents and trying to resolve these issues, uh, meeting with outside uh, people, either from the investigation or your own legal representatives. Um, that can add up quite a bit, quite high also, uh, yeah, loss of productivity. That's a good point, Paul. Some of these cases we read go on for years, and that's tying up a tremendous amount of administrative cost time. And also, when we're hiring our um, consultants to come in and help us. So there's a tremendous financial consequence. There's also the consequence of the uh, reputation, loss of reputation. No university wants to be on the front page of the newspaper connected with a fraud, um, that we lose trust of our governing boards, our employees. And I read in one um, audit that NSF did, were, had done where they pointed to a fraud that was in the newspaper as one of the uh, reasons that this institution was selected for audit. So we do have those negative consequences in the, for press coverage. And then we have the personal consequences. We have employees that are losing their jobs. 
Um, and we also have, a lot of times, it's not only the person that committed the fraud, but it's other individuals that were connected to it that sh- were in a position to know or should have known and help curtail the fraud. And at times, we're going to talk about people a little later that have gone to jail. So we have con- conservation. So there's quite a few consequences of fraud. Right. And you just got to understand that the people that actually embezzle money, they're the ones that actually plead guilty, and they're the ones that, um, you know, will be uh, charged with paying restitution, paying fines, um, and may be incarcerated, get sent to prison. Um, the institution is left with having to, sometimes if it's a, a civil settlement, they have to pay fines and penalties, uh, pay uh, damages, uh, and, and then they have to deal with the administrative side of, of who, who allowed some of these things to take place and whether they should be left in their positions or not. So there's the personal side of it, and then there's also the institutional side. Um, in, in reference to the press coverage, one of the things is when, I, when somebody like me comes in and does a criminal investigation, there is going to be press coverage. There's no way you can get around it. You just have to um, survive it. You have to, you have to try to put the best spin you can on it. And if you cooperate, then you can say, look, we've, we cooperated with the investigation. We're glad justice has taken place. And we try to do whatever we can to limit these kind of actions at our institution. Go ahead, Shirley. Okay, thanks. So, Paul, we promised the audience that we talk about the difference between civil and criminal cases. Now, I notice when I look at these, when I read through these cases in the press, we see a lot more civil than criminal. So can you go over with us the difference between what, what would make a, an agency such as NSF decide between what's, what is going to go civil and what's going to go criminal? Well, there's a statute called the Civil False Claims Act, and it's uh, Title 31 of the United States Code, and it's under Section 3729. Um, and what that does, it's actually been around since the Civil War, and it it allows the government to take action against contractors. And it first started off with uh, carpetbaggers that were coming in and falsely charging the government for things that that they never provided. And it provides uh, liability for for, uh, the government to take civil action. Uh, It includes fines up to $10,000 per claim. Uh, and it, it it can charge up to treble damages. So if you have a $100,000 fraud and the government takes action, civil action, uh, and they win, they can get up to treble damages. So that $100,000 turns into 300000 Same thing if you've got a million-dollar fraud, you can get damages up to $3 million. So that's where it gets quite expensive. Um, also, under a civil uh, fraud case, the burden of proof is preponderance of the evidence. And this is important to know when you're dealing with uh, what kind of fraud it is, versus civil versus criminal. Uh, but the civil burden of proof is preponderance of the evidence, which means basically 51%. Uh, most of the time, the government won't take action unless they have 60 or 70%. Um, there is no uh, specific intent that needs to be proved under a civil case. Uh, instead, the uh, uh, burden is on the government to prove there is either deliberate ignorance or reckless disregard for the truth. So if an institution is sticking its head in the sand uh, and there was information that came to their attention but they refused to look at it, then there can be a – the government can decide that they have enough to go forward under a civil false claims case. Uh, also, there is a compliance plan that usually accompanies a settlement, a, a civil settlement, meaning the institution will correct these things and try to put into place internal concro- controls to uh, identify uh, future frauds or, or limit future frauds. And then uh, oftentimes uh, there can be just a corrective action plan and then an agreement to return funds. If uh, an institution voluntarily comes forward, um, the civil settlement can become much easier. Um, A lot of times the institution 
is benefiting in some kind of way, and that's why there might be a civil case against the institution. There is money that is uh, being mischarged. The institution has a gain of some type, and um, or they had deliberate – there was – information that came to their attention, they knew they should take action, and they didn't take action. And then the government decides, okay, this is this was really uh, uh, an institutional problem, not just an individual fraud. Um, to move forward to... Well, different- I have a question before we go on, if you don't mind. Sure. So let me ask you this, because a lot of times in a policy, I'll read where the, the responsibility is on the P.I., so is the government's position maybe that it's not just the PI but the institution? Well, the institution is a grantee. You've got to remember that. Under a federal grant, the grant doesn't go to the PI. It goes to the institution. So the university is actually the grantee. They're responsible for it. The PI is the person in charge of of the actual project. So he is the institution's employee that's responsible for that. Just like if a a professor, a researcher, transfers from one institution to another, that grant doesn't automatically follow that individual. The institution, the grantee, has to say, we agree that this, this project can be transferred. Also, if, if a PI leaves the, and there's other people at the institution that can carry on the research, like a co-PI, then they can uh, make the case that the grant should stay at their institution. So the grant goes to the, the institution, not to the actual individual. However, everybody involved in the process can have some responsibility. The Office of Sponsor Program sets up a post-award um, system to monitor things. Uh, there are uh, financial uh, aspects of the grant that go through your accounts uh, payable, uh, your business office. All those people throughout the process have some responsibility. Okay, great. Thank you. And we have, if it's okay, I'm going to just insert one question we have from the audience. And they're asking on this slide, how often have civil cases been taken in recent times? Um, it, you'll see when we start to go through recent civil cases, uh, most of them deal with uh, health and human services, NIH grants. Uh, NSF does do civil cases uh, on occasions. Uh, I've been here for 24 years at NSF. I have never brought a civil false claims case against a higher education institution. My experiences with civil false claims cases have been with um, businesses or other nonprofits, not higher education, where they were actually involved, you know, as an institutional fraud. Um, there have been civil false cases brought by NSF, but it's more on a limited basis, and, and we specially don't do it. I specially don't recommend that it be done if an institution is cooperating with us during the investigation, and we identify who is actually embezzling the funds, and okay. and, and we can move forward in that, that realm. Perfect. Thanks. Are we ready to move? We're ready. Okay. Ooh. Oops. You and I both did it at the same time. That's one of the things about uh, doing this uh, from Florida and Arlington, Virginia at the same time. <laughs> Criminal fraud cases. Uh, as I discussed under civil cases, the burden of proof on a civil case is uh, preponderance of the evidence. A burden of proof in a criminal case is beyond a reasonable doubt. And the government not only has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, which, you know, if you followed any criminal cases, these high-profile criminal cases that go on in the press, you know, that a jury has to decide, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt, whether it's, you know, nobody knows if it's 98 percent, 99 percent, but that's quite a high burden the government has to prove. And the government also has to prove in a criminal case knowledge and intent that the perpetrator actually knew what he was doing and intended to take the act. Um, and in my, I've been doing this for well over 20 years, and especially at higher education, I've had travel fraud cases where we've had false uh, travel vouchers, duplicate travel payments uh, submitted to multiple sources. Uh, we've had payroll fraud cases where we've had false or fictitious employees or false 
just timesheets put in or false uh, uh, time and effort reports put in for people that were family members or uh, other relative, you know, other associates of, of the person involved. We've had stipend fraud cases where there's participants that uh, didn't really work as a participant were paid. We also had cases where stipends were issued above the standard thing and we're told, oh, you, you received a mistaken check. Can I have that check back? And uh, the perpetrator was putting that money into his pocket. Um, we've had invoice fraud cases where we've had fake consulting fees or uh, even enhanced vendor fees where the vendor was actually given a kickback to the people at the university to uh, receive these these invoices, to receive these this business. Um, and one of the new things we'll talk about is duplicate funding cases, where we have additional funding sources all coming into a PI. Sometimes it involves a grant to the university and where the professor is a PI, but the professor also owns a personal business, uh, an SBIR, a small business innovation research company, and gets money that way. And by getting duplicate funding, they were able to enhance their own personal profit and, uh, and fund their personal activities outside of the university. Uh, and we'll talk about those cases as we move on. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit, bit about why people commit fraud. And I want to make the statement that what we're seeing, the people involved in this are good people, and good people commit fraud. So uh, it's probably it's your well-respected employees, their grandmothers, their mothers, their grandfathers. Um, we, there was a case in the press a couple of years ago where we had a nun at a college that was arrested for stealing $1.2 million. We also, there was a case we read that even the, the feds are not, you know, um, are still are susceptible where they had an, uh, NS, uh, an OIG special agent for NASA that stole money from his church and uh, committed fraud on his tax return. So it's good, these good people commit fraud, and it may be the least likely person that we would expect. And so when we look at why good people commit fraud, one of the best, most widely accepted models is a fraud triangle. And this was developed by a criminologist, Dr. Donald Creasy, and he studied embezzlers. And uh, he said the three factors that need to be present for an ordinary person to commit fraud are in the fraud triangle. And the first is pressure. So what he perceived, there needs to be, the individual has to perceive non-charitable financial aid needs. So there's some reason that they feel they need to commit the fraud. And that can be an inability to pay bills. It could be caused by having a sick child and you need the funds. And it could be also a desire for a status symbol. I need to have a BMW because everybody in Miami has a BMW and it just won't look right. So there's lots of those non-shareable financial needs. That's just called greed, right? Correct. And then, uh, you know, the other thing that needs to be in place in our, in our triangle, the second leg, is rationalization. So the individual has to be able to justify the crime in a way that makes it acceptable or justifiable act in their mind. So, and those could be, you know, they, the institution owes it to me. You know, we haven't received raises for four or five years, and they don't recognize all the work I do. I work on the weekends. Um, it I could was passed be, over for, for promotion. I was passed over for promotion. Um, it's necessary for me to take my wife on these trips because I'm going on so many trips and I spend so much of my personal time traveling that I can justify it in that way. Um, and then also it could be that, you know, I'm just going to borrow a little bit and I'm going to pay it back. I have this need. I'm not really going to steal. I'm just going to borrow and then I'll get it back to the institution. Uh, and then the third leg is there needs to be the opportunity. So the person must be some way, see some way they can use their position of trust to, uh, with, to commit the fraud and they, they need to be able to perceive there's some low level risk of getting caught. And when I've looked at some of the um, comments that came back from, from embezzlers, and one thing they, they say is, if it wasn't so easy, I wouldn't have done it. 
was just so easy, I thought, that was there. Um, so I, that's one thing to keep in mind, again, as we look at set policy procedures and look at our internal controls. We don't want to make it too easy. One thing to keep in mind is all, um, all of you are in higher education. Uh, your institutions are places of trust. Uh, you trust the PIs to do the right thing. They, they're claiming to do, they, they're going to this to do something good. My experience is that most of these people start off doing something good and then something takes over. Um, it could be the greed factor or it could be ego. It could be need. Like Charlene said, sometimes they have a family member that is, uh, is not well and they have medical expenses. Um, I've had a, a fellow that was embezzling because he had AIDS, and the medication was so expensive for him to take. Um, these, all these factors play into it, but at universities, they are places of trust, and your people are there to do a job, and you have to trust them. And also, especially at the larger institutions, the volume of expenditures that come through in reference to sponsored programs is astronomical. And there's no way that, that any institution can see everything that comes through. But one thing that's unique I've noticed with, about universities is that we're really large, decentralized areas. So if I have a large center, it has a lot of autonomy running out there. And so they may not have a lot of staff. And they, the person in control, the dean that's in control, has a lot of authority. And so it's, it's very, you know, he's able to circumvent those systems. That's right. And a lot of places where the uh, researchers who bring in a lot of money, they have a lot of clout, and people are fearful to confront them. And uh, a lot of the times the PIs use intimidation. They can intimidate people. Oh, you don't know what I'm doing. You don't understand what I'm doing. Uh, where an administrative person will just try to hide what they do. They will cover up what they do. They will be the outstanding employee that's always pitching in to help somebody out. Um, so it depends on who the person is, what their rationale, what their rationalization is, and what their financial pressure is. Okay, great. Thanks. So let's talk about, go ahead and talk about some of the recent civil cases that have made the news. And the first one we'll talk about is the Northwestern case. And this was a civil fraud claim that was a key TAM filed by a former employee of the Cancer Center. And what she alleged was that the PI was using the money, the grant money, for personal trips, meals, and hotels, benefiting his friends and family. Um, and what they, I think some of the things that came out in the, in the news was that he uh, had written consulting agreements to his brother and a cousin, and he took his wife on these consulting trips, or took his wife on these trips, and then the grant paid for all the food, the hotel, so all the, the expenses. And so uh, Northwestern ended up selling that case for $3.5 million. They cooperated on that. And Dr. Bennett, is now an endowed chair in South Carolina. So I take my you know, hats off to my, my friends in South Carolina. Um, you have a challenge. And then uh, the other case we'll look at is Cornell. Well, we're going to be looking at several Cornell cases, but this was a really interesting case. And so what happened with Cornell is a key TAM case, false billing of clinical patients. And it, this was – Cornell had a um, – an award from NIH related to HIV AIDS research for postdoc fellows. And one of the fellows filed a key TAM and charged that the PI and Cornell were uh, inappropriately having the fellows see private fee-for-service fee patients with other medical conditions. And the PI on this grant did do a lot of work for insurance companies and litigators. And so the, during trial, and this one did, Cornell did fight it, this one did go to trial. And in, in the trial, the uh, postdoc was able to, to illustrate that of the 160 clinical patients seen by the fellows, only three were HIV positive. The government joined in the suit for this one and alleged that they had knowingly submitted false reports uh, to NIH in order to continue funding of the grant. So those progress reports, we talk about what we're doing. So 
So we need to make sure that what we're saying in there is all, is uh, really what's going on. Now, the, there was another, in this case, an interesting argument that Cornell and the PI tried to bring up, um, and they, they, uh, they said that they had achieved the goal of the grant since they could show that a majority of the, these postdocs went into AIDS research and that the program was really akin to a car trip. So it didn't really matter what route you took as long as some of the fel- fellows ultimately arrived at their destination, which was the career in HIV-related research. Um, the jury did not concur with that argument. They lost and when Cornell appealed, and they lost on appeal. So... Um, so Charlene, this is this is a frequent ar- argument we hear is that, oh, we didn't do what we said we'd do in the proposal, but we still had a good outcome, so therefore it should be okay. And reality is the government makes decisions to fund something based on what the proposal said, and their impact in those areas are are what they're trying to influence. And so if you're if you decide to change a direction, like NSF's grant conditions, if you change the scope of your project, you need NSF approval to do that. And if you don't get the agency approval when you start changing the direction or the scope of your project, then you have yourself liable for what could come up in the future. And as you see in both these cases, the institution took a heck of a hit because they – went along with what was the billing practices that had been established. And there was some knowledge that in both the Northwestern and the Cornell cases, the schools knew that they weren't doing everything they should be doing. They, they knew there was problems, but they continued to process the payments and then bill the government for those, those payments. Okay, great. Thanks, Paul. Now let's talk about the Yale case. I think most of us, have probably seen the the Yale when it hit the papers. I think about 2004, 2005. No, actually, uh, this was 2009, I think. Yeah, the Yale uh, recent uh, case. You're right, that one. That was the recent case. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, and that began as a result of an audit that mm-hmm. that was done on a small sub award they had with UMass, um, and that led then to it ended up with the uh, um, 30, about 30 agencies, I believe, being reviewed. And NSF was one of the agencies, if I recall, Paul. Correct. We had and, people uh, in my office highly involved in this investigation. So, And the issues they had were the allocation of research expenses, um, the reporting of faculty effort devoted to the grants, that issues with their grants administration. And what happened, and one thing that, that we want to highlight is there was an email where the PI asked to spend down the funds, which was altered and given to the auditors. And the auditors then uncovered the original email. So this one was uh, very expensive for Yale, that the settlement was one hat was $7.6 million, and half of that was in punitive damages. So, and that went on, I believe, for several years. And when reading through the news reports, it looked like they went back over a 10-year period, so that had to be a tremendous administrative cost as well to the institution. Yes, this was um, uh, quite an interesting uh, issue because um, it, it appeared for quite a few years uh, Yale acknowledged in internal communications that they knew that they were um, uh, wrongfully applying some of their own time and, and effort um, uh, uh, policies, and they weren't consistent with what the um, Cognizant Audit Agency was saying they should be doing. Um, and so over a period of time, they knew what they were doing, but they continued to do it. They didn't take action to change their process. And then the cost transfers, there was some communications where they said, you know, look, we really shouldn't be doing that. And uh, in today's world, uh, the investigators are always going to look at emails. I mean, that's that's just the nature of, of what goes on anymore. Uh, electronic evidence, emails are a big part of, of things we look at. And so if you have internal communications that say, look, we shouldn't be doing that, and yet nobody takes action, then that's going to affect the outcome of these matters. Okay, 
Great, thanks. Okay. And here's some more cases we'll cover. And these I want to look at really how the case was brought forward. How did the government find out about the case? Um, and if we look at, there's one that recently came out in the news in August with Emory University. And in this case, they had a uh, individual that was in their um, a clinical research manager in their cancer institute that brought a key TAM. And what she alleged that over a 10-year period that the institution had billed Medicaid and Medicare for patients enrolled in clinical trials, and that in some cases the Emory had paid twice. Emory did cooperate in this, and they had a $1.5 million settlement in that. But that's it. We're going to see issues, several of these, that involve clinical trial billing. Um, and these uh, patient, you know, private patient care. Um, and then we have the next case is well, Cornell. And Cornell did have a series of cases that hit the news. Um, in the 2010, that um, was the case that we had just discussed. And in that, as we'd heard, that they, of course, lost at trial and lost at appeal. And they did have a $800,000 settlement, but that was treble damages because of the case. Um, and in 2009, they had an issue, and um, in this case, there was a senior administrative assistant to the PI who filed a key TAM, and among other things she alleged was that they failed to disclose the research activity. And what they alleged that it was not only the PI, but the PI and the Office of Research were named, and they failed to disclose the full extent of the PI's research activities. Um, and the government joined in. The government's position was that the college knew or should have known that the employee failed to fully disclose their active research projects, and that exceeded 100% of their time. Well, that, goes, did, that goes back to your burden of being able to prove that there was a reckless disregard for the truth or deliberate ignorance. Um, you can't just turn your head if you know you're supposed to be doing something or there's, there's a problem. Uh, right. While I'm talking, Charlene, I might bring up, uh, for you, those of you who don't know what key tam means, it's a Latin term that says, in the name of the king. And it was uh, it was an old um, uh, British uh, common law theory that, that a citizen could bring a suit on behalf of the king and recover. And that has been part of the Civil False Claims Act for, you know, the whole time it's been in existence. So individuals, whistleblowers, can come forward and file a suit against the institution. And the government, the U.S. government, decides whether they want to join it or not. And that person, the, the person that brings the key TAM, uh, gets a part of the settlement if there is a settlement in favor of the government. Um, and that's why you have these people that bring forward these key TAM suits. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. And the one thing that they also mentioned, the government mentioned in this case, is that they relied on those disclosure of those activities before they awarded to determine that if they had the bandwidth to do the award. Um, and then what they, and because they did not, they didn't full report as they were supposed to all the activities, they couldn't make a good informed decision. So, and then the next case, again, this is another Cornell case, and this also involved private patient care. And this one was in 2005, and I remember when it hit the front page of the Wall Street Journal, because this was a physician who filed a key TAM, and the physician alleged that they were using NIH money for private patient care. So they had, the, again, a $23 million award intended to study childhood disease, and instead, but she's saying that they, the nurses that were paid from the ward that were supposed to be working on this project were seeing other patients that they had in the medical school. And that the money that was meant for the core lab, NIH lab, for testing, they used it for other tests, the tests in other labs in these private labs. And they spent the money on uh, unrelated to the NIH grant. And this was a case where we had two PIs who controlled all the money. And so that one, like I said, that was a a large award, and they ended up uh, selling that for four point four million. Well, once, no. again, once again, you'll notice that a lot of these cases involve uh, medical. Uh, NIH puts out about forty billion per year 
in grants, where NSF puts out about seven to eight billion. So there's a lot of money that goes out in NIH grants, and these grants are quite large, and they're supposed to have an impact in certain areas of of our society, and and that's what the grants are for. Um, go ahead, Charlene. Okay, and then we'll talk about the the University of Connecticut. And this one was an anonymous complaint that went to the university, and their internal audit uh, reviewed, felt they had a problem, and they self-reported. So this is one that came through to the university, and the university then took action. Um, and this involved, this, it was two large service centers, but there were some other areas they looked at, too. This was an issue they had where in, they had with summer, PI summer pay, and they were paying in excess of base the summer salaries. And they also had some unallowable costs. And this ties back to the service center in that in those service center costs and those rates, those costs need to be allowable just as though we were direct charging on a grant. So that caused University of Connecticut a problem. The other thing they had, these, these rates were really old. And so the government alleged that it was, it was false claims because they were submitting bills that didn't have a basis and um, charges to back them up. So it's important that we make sure that we do those biannual updates on the rates and that we make sure that all those charges in there are allowable charges for our service centers. Um, and then the next one was in UAB. That was a actually two simultaneous key TAM lawsuits. One was brought by the compliance officer and one was brought by a physician. And they had research work was overstated, and what they this was problems they had at the proposal stage. Um, so at the proposal stage, it's really important that we document how much. Again, this is on effort. How much, so the government knows how much effort we put in these awards, how much effort PI has in is, is spending. The other issue they had was the way with effort was being reported. And so they also had a, they were billing Medicare for research related, uh, it was funded elsewhere. So they had the clinical trial research, billing Medicare for clinical trial, which we're seeing is kind of a common issue that in some of these settlements with the medical cases. So they ended up paying $3.4 million. And last but not least is the Mayo, uh, and Mayo fraud, but that was actually a key tam brought by someone in research accounting. And uh, this, uh, this was alleged of improper transfers from overspent grants. So what they were doing is they were using the money, transferring costs. If a grant was overspent, they transferred it to another award. Or, and they were also, if a grant was underspent, we, there were some internal, internal charges going on those awards. So, um, you know, the government charged that they were being charged for grants unrelated to the NIH grants that it was supposed to cover. Um, and so, and I just got it. Let me respond to this question real quick. And uh, we're asking for distributed links to the press releases or summaries of the cases. Um, if we look at, again, look at the, a lot of those references are in the um, summary of audits that you'll find that the announcer uh, gave you the website for in the cost accounting web serve. That, uh, the website that, Charlene has helped develop on the on the the uh, National Conference on College Accounting Cost Accounting website um, is really quite a thorough um, list, and and there is so much information that is useful to your institutions that, and it's really a, an enormous undertaking that she has done. It really is quite a link. It, it's amazing for me to sit there and look at. Thank you. Thank you. It's a hobby. So, so let's look at now, let's, we've, we've covered the civil. Let's look at some of the criminal cases. And some of the criminal ta cases we're going to tell you about today involve uh, different scenarios. And the one we're going to talk about, these next couple of cases are fraud by researchers. And these particular researchers uh, had cases where the PI used a privately owned company they controlled to convert funds for their personal use. And the first case is Morgan State, and this was a Morgan State professor, but he applied for an award. He did apply for it from his small business, um, 
and, and he applied to the NSF Small Business Program. And when he applied for the award, he stated that he was going to uh, secure release time from his institution, um, that the, his small business had eight employees, that another Morgan State professor was going to be working with him as a scientific, uh, senior scientific advisor. He also stated that he had... Um, he was going to had, somehow that we had the University of Maryland that was going to be involved to help with this award. In fact, none of the he remained a full time professor at Morgan State, and none of the statements were true. And instead, he used the money for to pay his mortgage. He paid personal credit cards. Uh, he pay, made salary payments to his wife, although she didn't work on any of the NSF project. And he wrote a six thousand dollar check to himself. And so that case is ongoing. And I think in 2003, I mean 2013, he was back in the news. The government alleged that he was issuing stipend checks to students and asking them to give the money back to him. And I don't know, I know this was ongoing. So I don't know if you can comment on this at all, Paul. Uh, Charlene, I can't, cannot comment on this case because it is an ongoing case. Uh, there has been an indictment. Um, he is uh, facing trial. Um, and because of that, we can't really talk about that, but everything you've mentioned has been out to the, been out in the press, so that's public information. Um, so I guess also I can say right now, if it's in the press, I guess it must be true. But, uh, so we will uh, follow this case, and yes. once it's, once it's uh, finalized and, and we have a sentence, then I guess we'll hear more about it. Right, but the Penn State case is a closed case. Um, if you would like to go over the details of that, I was not the case agent. A close colleague of mine was the case agent, so I have some some interesting little tidbits about that. But I'll let you talk about the you know what's known as the facts in this case right now, the Penn State case. Okay, and this was a really interesting case. So this was a former researcher at Penn State. And again, he was acting through a solely owned company, and he requested a grant from NIH. And in the grant, he represented that he was going to take about half the money, and he was going to do clinical trials at the Hershey Cancer Center. And of course, the clinical trials were never performed, and he ended up misappropriating the funds for his personal use. And that, that, so that was count one. And count two, as a professor at Penn State, he obtained a grant. And in that grant, he stated that, and, and the grant was with the Department of Energy was applying, he made a false statement that he had no other funding for the research, uh, when in fact he did have an NSF grant. And when the Office of Research asked him about it, he assured them that these were not connected, that they, these uh, two projects were not connected. And then a year later, he publishes an article in which he states that he had funding both from Energy and from NSF to fund the same project. Yeah, that, that's how this case actually started with one of our case agents um, and an agent from Department of Energy uh, found that he was – that he had proposed the same thing. And when comparing the two proposals, they were – basically identical. So he was going to do the same research for both NSF and Department of Energy. And he lied to both agencies. He lied to uh, Penn State about the relatedness of these projects. And um, luckily, our investigation took place in, in such a timely manner that he wasn't able to misappropriate much of the money that was awarded, but both those grants were terminated. But during that investigation, uh, while they were looking into this individual and how he was spending his money through the university, they stumbled across the fact that he had a small business, that he received SBIR funding. And that was the whole second half of the case. So it, it, one of the things that I'd like to point out is the Morgan State case, the Penn State case, we have, currently have a series of cases that are going on where researchers at universities are also starting their own company and are not fully disclosing to the government or to their own universities what they're doing with these private companies. And we've even seen in some cases where people use university resources, I mean, resources awarded to them through their position at the university to fund their private business practices. And this is, uh, this is a problem, and that's why conflict of interest disclosures are very important. 
And uh, the rationale, this was interesting, too, the rationale that he gave the judge, that he, he was just so zealous and wanting to help the world that he couldn't help himself. So he got 41 months. He did get prison time. He did for 41 months. Um, and one thing I want to know, I want to follow up on is, is your statement that on these conflict of interest, that sometimes they don't report them on the conflict of interest form, so the universe institution may be unaware. That's, that's what we're finding out in a great number of these. So it, it is something where I think the new NIH policy that they have to, um, um, the public health service policy, that disclosures have to be fully made, um, and there's not as much leeway as there used to be, is actually a, a good thing. NSF hasn't moved in that direction yet, but um, I think that's going to allow more information to be clear about what your researchers are working on outside of the university. Okay, great. Thanks. So we've talked about, you know, those cases with the private companies. Let's, now let's talk, let's switch to one and talk about some cases that we have where the individual, in these cases, the individual managed a center. They had a lot of control, and they diverted payments from the center to other nonprofits, or they had, you know, an associate, they're associated with some of the university where they channeled the money through, and then ultimately this went into private bank accounts. And I'm going to turn this over to you, Paul. Well, first uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, fraud by managers. Uh, you know, they have a lot of power at the, at the university. Uh, one of the recent cases is the University of Louisville case of Dean Fellner. Uh, he pled guilty to embezzling $2.25 million from three different institutions and was sentenced to five years in prison. And that was not an NSF case, but uh, this case really sparked some interest because here was a guy that was able to, as dean of multiple places, was able to really divert a large amount of funding for his own purposes uh, and embezzle funds from, from really three different institutions. Um, and you really have to watch, you know, when... Uh, and the lesson here is the amount of authority somebody in the management chain has. Um, and I'll be able to spell this out more in detail in cases that I worked. Um, um, the first one I'd like to talk about is that uh, a case that was on, that's on Charlene's um, uh, website, uh, NACA website, is uh, uh, Barbara Nye, TSU, Tennessee State University. And she was a center director and manager of, of uh, a pretty good-sized center at Tennessee State University. And she actually brought in more money than anybody else in the whole university at Tennessee State University. She brought in NSF money, NIH money, uh, state money, private money. Um, and she ran quite an organization out of the center that did a lot of things in education, childhood education, early childhood education, and her NSF grants were for elementary school education, hands-on science uh, programs. But the problem started when uh, uh, Dr. Nye and her uh, one of her subordinates started their own private company to do hands-on science training also. And we figured out that she received over $120,000 in funding outside of the university that went directly into her pocket uh, that was never disclosed to the university. And those could have come in and helped the program that she was currently doing. But we also found, while looking closely at what she did in, in, in reference to the money that was awarded to her at Tennessee State University from NSF, that she used travel funds and salary money to support her own private business. Um, she had people that were working on her, being paid off the NSF grant that were actually going out and doing work that her and her subordinate were getting paid for, and the money was going to their private company. So they were getting free labor, and that turns into pure profit for them, and it also was a false charge to the university. And she eventually pled guilty to submitting $25,000 worth of false statements to pay for travel and salary benefits and was sentenced to six months home confinement, uh, two years probation, and she was also debarred for a period of five years. Uh, the interesting thing that happened during this was when we were uh, going through the sentencing phase of this case, the 
TSU internal auditor notified me that they also found duplicate travel funding from one of her research site directors um, who worked in California. And this individual was a superintendent of a school district in California that worked on one of the research grants. And what we do is we don't automatically stop the funding that takes place. Um, we allowed the grants to go forward with a substitute PI. Uh, Co-PI took over the, the research project, and this project was supposed to compare the research site in California that did hands-on science training to the research site in Tennessee. And it started out as, as just a simple duplicate funding, but then turned into a quite elaborate thing, and it shows you how much power a person in a position of authority like a superintendent can can have. And the interesting thing was that this guy was not only a superintendent, he was getting paid by Tennessee State University and also getting paid by San Diego State University to work on um, on research projects and was also paid as a consultant on multiple education institutions. Um, he was traveling all the time and working on various things and getting paid by various people without ever – notifying his school board that he was getting paid by all these sources. Um, so Barbara and I was a $25,000 case, and yet it led into this case, and we found that Clinchy transferred NSF grant funds. He was getting his own grants to the school district from NSF and Department of Education, and he was transferring those funds to San Diego State University. And a private company while concealing his conflicts from the San Diego State University and um, and his own school board. Our investigation, which started off with just a couple duplicate payments between Tennessee State University and the school district, uh, within six months we we had found 68 duplicate travel payments between the superintendent, all of them charged to his school district, and we found 27 different institutions that paid him a duplicate travel payment. These were universities, they were um, school districts, they were education associations, um, but 27 different institutions. This was a record for uh, uh, travel fraud that uh, I haven't, we have yet to see one that comes close to this. Um, besides his 68 duplicate travel reimbursements, he also had his science staff were paid 11 times for travel, when they traveled with him, they received reimbursements. They knew they were duplicate reimbursements, and they gave the cash back to the superintendent with him telling them that he was going to return the money to the actual school district. And, of course, there is no record that he actually returned that cash to the school district. Uh, we ca we uh, calculated that he received over 60000 in duplicate travel payments. He also received another 70000 in consulting payments and speaking fees uh, from these various uh, institutions that he went and saw that, was, uh, that he never disclosed to the school district he was receiving. Um, the other thing he did as the site director for the Tennessee State Grant, um, he received a $25,000 salary every year as the site director for the site, uh, which for, for five years figured out to be $150,000. We focused on a time period in 2006 and 2007 where there was a lot of fraudulent transactions for duplicate salary, duplicate travel, false data that was submitted to the, uh, in reference to the grant, and that amount of salary was $50,000, and, and we focused on that $50,000 he received during that time. Also during that same time of 2006 and 2007, he was paying family friends uh, to process student testing data, and our investigation concluded that $46,000 was paid, and there was really very little evidence that any work was actually done by these people. Um, the salary to the superintendent, also the, uh, there was salary that went to the superintendent's son for uh, doing videotapes of teachers, where it was $24,000 paid that the superintendent actually went into his bank account. But this uh, son was actually being paid for the same kind of videotaping work through the school district that uh, 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 
through his father's school district. So it looked like a duplicate payment to us. And then there was also uh, one time where he turned data over on an NSF grant, um, and uh, the payment to process the data was $20,000. And he had arranged for a consultant to bill the NSF TSU grant $20,000, and that payment was then transferred to Clinchy. And it looked to us like his own staff at the school district collected all the data, testing data, and turned it over to the consultant, yet he retained the $20,000. So that was just some of the fraud that we came across that he was doing through Tennessee State University. Well, while out in California, we then found out that he was also receiving payments through San Diego State University because he was cooper- he was a um, a, a researcher on several grants through the university and was also transferring NSF funds from the school district to San Diego State to assist him on the grant. Um, San Diego State, of course, is in San Diego, but Dr. Clinchy was in El Centro, California. And the San Diego staff was at the Imperial Valley site, which is 120 miles east of San Diego out in the desert. So they were remote, and San Diego State really didn't know what was going on at that site. And um, we had found that uh, not only was there payments going back and forth between the assistant research director and Clinchy, but also uh, Clinchy was paying the university grant coordinator at the San Diego uh, Imperial Valley campus to be a consultant to him, and this person was the one that was making sure all the payments to the university was going. And off the NSF grant alone, there was $78,000 worth of NSF salary payments paid through San Diego State to the superintendent where he was processed as an assistant research director. And we found very little evidence that he did anything except for attend some meetings for this assistant research director money. Um, We also recommended that the school board and Department of Education funds be transferred to San Diego State. Uh, as an assistant research grant, uh, assistant researcher with Department of Education money, Department of Education OIG worked along with us on this matter, and they found that thirty-two thousand dollars was improperly paid by an assistant dean and the grant coordinator for Clinchy to be paid as an assistant research uh, director off of assistant researcher off of the Department of Education funds. In addition, we found that uh, uh, Clinchy recommended that the Department of Education uh, pay, the Department of Education funds pay an outside company. And this company was owned by the assistant dean. And the assistant dean was supposed to provide an external evaluation outside of San Diego State University. Um, Clinchy initiated payments of over $395,000 off the education grant. Um, the assistant dean and the professor uh, that was involved in the other grant, the NSF grant, performed an external evaluation, was paid $152,000 each. Super, uh, Clinchy was paid $90,000 as an assistant researcher off of, through the company, but there was no evidence that he ever worked as an assistant researcher on the grants that, I mean, on the contracts that he actually approved through his school uh, school district. Uh, the company invoices approved uh, um, uh, were approved by Clinchy himself and stated that uh, the contract actually stated that 90000 was to go to an assistant researcher, and, of course, nobody knew that the assistant researcher was Clinchy himself. So you get an idea of how involved one of these consultants, one of these high officials that is so involved, can it can have an impact. Um, the results of this were that the assistant dean, the professor, the grant coordinator, none of them at San Diego State disclosed to the university what was going on. Um, they didn't even uh, disclose the possible conflicts when they were processing payments for Clinchy through the university. Uh, in the end, when they were, when after they had talked to us, the university initiated their own investigation. They all resigned or retired um, from the university uh, when the university told them that they would be terminated for their actions. Um, 
We indicted both Clinchy uh, on two things. One was wire fraud and uh, pro- theft of program fraud in reference to the duplicate travel and the false salary payments and the false student test scores um, off of the Re- Tennessee State Research Grant. We also uh, uh, indicted Clinchy, the assistant dean and the professor at San Diego State for conspiracy to commit mail fraud and theft of government funds related to all of the the salary and consulting payments paid off the NSF and Department of Education grants. In the end, uh, the superintendent pled guilty to two counts of wire fraud. Uh, the superint- he was sentenced to 10 months confinement, three years parole, and ordered to pay $325,000 of, of restitution. Um, Ten months doesn't sound like a long time. Uh, It was actually uh, the sentencing guidelines recommended 27 months. However, because of medical conditions, the judge decided 10 months would be sufficient. Uh, The assistant dean and professor both pled guilty to submitting false statements to the university and were uh, sentenced to five years supervised probation. The judge ordered all of them not to work in education during the time that they were on probation. And Department of Education has initiated debarment of all the individuals. Amazing. Well, that was an extensive fraud. Uh, it, you know, it really wasn't extensive. It took five years to conduct that investigation, and from the time we opened it till the time that they were sentenced, um, we had collected over 300,000 documents from 28 different institutions. Um, the uh, PI on the TSU research grant said that the, the, all the time and funds that he expended on the grant after 2006 when this false data came in were, were basically a waste. Um, even though his researchers at, in Tennessee and uh, the, the grad students working on the project did stuff that the results they got were all tainted because of the false data. Um, also, you know, the, the impact on San Diego State, um, they had to pay a contractor to come in and sort out all the problems on their various state and federal grants. Um, they wrongfully, and they figured out that they wrongfully spent over $800,000 on these various projects, and they returned $264,000 to NSF just right off the bat. Now, some of that included the wrongful payments to Clinchy under salary payments, and of course, Clinchy is ordered to reimburse San Diego State for that. But the they used an audit standard to say uh, $264,000 of NSF funds. They said, we, we can't sustain it, these charges if somebody would come in. They included payments from uh, stipend payments to actually pay salary payments for computer work and things like that because they didn't want to process uh, uh, legitimate salary payments to the university for various reasons. They'd rather use stipend funds to to pay for services. Um, it included a lot of problems, um, and it took them years to sort this out. And they had to pay, you know, contractors and everything, you know, return money to funding agencies. It was quite uh, quite an experience. Um, and for you guys out there, we didn't charge San Diego State with a civil false statement case because they coordinated with us every step along the way and we persuaded the U.S. Attorney's Office Civil Division that San Diego State was actually a victim in this. San Diego State and TSU was a victim in the fraud and you know we couldn't have done this investigation in five, even in five years without the assistance of both San Diego State and, and Tennessee State University um, and, and I commend both the institutions for all their hard work on, on this, this, this devastating matter that include deans and grant, you know, a grant official um, and, you know, a superintendent. And all people you would suspect would not be involved in fraudulent activity. Okay, great. Well, thank you for going over that. That was an interesting scheme that they had set up. Um, Let's talk a little bit briefly about then fraud by administrative support. We've kind of hit the talked about the other areas and those in positions of control, and uh, where they had frauds. So let's talk about in a, the Georgia Tech pro card cases. And I had heard Paul talk about this a few years ago at FRA, 
and it was just fascinating. So can you go over those for us, Paul? Sure. I'll quickly go over this. Many of you that have seen me speak at uh, Encura or some of the other conferences have heard me talk about the Georgia Tech purchase card cases. Um, and these are fraud by admin people. And what they were doing was, if you think back about our um, – uh, fraud triangle, they were people that were trying to enhance their uh, their lifestyle in in Atlanta. Um, and they were basically embezzling money through the purchase card system to uh, pay for their own living expenses. Uh, neither one of these people had anything, any of the money left over that they had stolen over a period of t- years. Uh, there was actually two different cases. One was a pro- program coordinator that was identified in the state audit of buying gift cards off the purchase card. And these weren't small $5 gift cards. They were $50, $100 a piece. And they originally thought it was about $20,000, but our, our investigation found it was the total fraud was much higher than that. The second case involved a center accountant who purchased Internet vendor and purchase card. And when I go through this, you'll really see why these were fraud cases um, and not civil cases, criminal fraud cases, because they both incur, it, it had a lot of vague receipts that were submitted by the purchase card users, and many of those receipts looked similar at the time of the initiation of the investigations. And both subjects, when they were initially interviewed by the internal audit department at uh, Georgia Tech, uh, resigned prior to um, uh, the NSF OIG getting involved in the investigation, uh, and both involved NSF funding, of course. Um, to give you an idea of what took place with the uh, coordinator, the program coordinator, we had found that she had misused the purchase card to buy gift cards at Walmart, Target, Sam's Club. She also used the purchase card to pay for her personal cell phone bills and cable services, auto repairs, insurance, grocery stores near her home, tuition parking at another university that included herself and her son, who was a college age. Um, she purchased a diamond ring off of Amazon.com, and she also submitted a quite large check request to buy what she claimed was uh, various uh, uh, books related to the the program. Um, as she said, as we said, she had resigned. Uh, however, she agreed to meet with me and one of my fellow agents. Um, and during our review, we had figured out that the fraud started actually six months after she arrived. Um, we had also figured out that there was over a thousand personal purchases from 65 different vendors, almost all of them locally in Atlanta. NSF, state, and private accounts were charged, and uh, she submitted a $5,000 check request. Um, she, we confront, you know, we went over these facts with her, and we were able to get a written confession from her. Um, and then after the confession, we briefed the state and federal prosecutors. And then the state prosecute. The government decided that the state would prosecute this case because almost all the charges were local. Um, at the same time, we had initiated the purchase card for the accountant, and in that case, after comparing the the charges through the university purchase card system um, with all the credit card bills. Uh, which we had to get by subpoena and vendor files from all the Internet vendors, we found that 3,800 personal purchases was made by the accountant, over 19,000 transactions through the university's financial system, and over 30 different accounts, over $300,000 were diverted. So you can see how somebody that has this kind of authority, you know, even limited authority at the university, and these people were really – concealing what they they did, and this is an important aspect of a criminal case, is the concealment of the activity. Uh, And you really see this when you have administrative personnel involved where they hide what they're doing. A lot of times the researchers and the, the administrative people have such power, they just put the paperwork in and don't do a lot to conceal it, but because they know people aren't going to question them. They're not going to question their integrity. However, these administrative people will do a lot of things to hide what they did. 
And under the, um, the accountant case, she had shipped a majority of items from Internet vendors to her home, so we knew that by comparing the records. We also interviewed her supervisors, her coworkers, and she was considered to be an outstanding employee, but they were shocked at the things that she bought off the purchase card and concealed those. She forged her supervisor's signature on P-card statement uh, review documents, and she actually had three purchase cards. So what she'd do is one month she would, she would all do almost all legitimate purchases, and she would tell her supervisor she only used this card this month, and she would have her, her, her supervisor sign the one um, statement that looked like it was all clean. The other two statements she would sign, she would forge her, the supervisor's signature so if it looked like somebody came in, they would say, oh, this has already been looked at and reviewed. Uh, we also found that she created false invoices and she manipulated the accounting system. Yeah, and Paul, can you talk about that just a little bit? Because this was interesting, because this involved cost transfers and how she was moving it, the funds around using cost transfers to not get caught. Okay, and we were able to show this to the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, by specifically looking at some items that were charged to the grant. And as you see on the screen here, we have specific items over $1,000 that we track through the grant. And, you know, we see a lawn tractor. Well, this was a bioengineering research center that she was an accountant for. Why would they need a lawn tractor is a damn good question. Um, however, she also purchased laptops. So how would do we identify if the laptop was a legitimate laptop for the university or was it for personal nature? And you'll see in a second how we ever figured it out. And, you know, one of the other things we decided to track was a bun frozen drink machine. Now, Charlene, you've been around sponsored programs for a long time. <laughs> Have you ever seen a bun frozen drink machine purchased off of a federal grant? No, unfortunately not. I must be not be working for the correct institutions because uh, I tell you, it's, uh, <laughs> that that was a clever one right there. <laughs> uh, but anyway, when we tracked what she did in the accounting system, and remember, she was an accountant for the research center, so she transferred the Poland lawn tractor, which she bought for over a thousand dollars, that was transferred three times in three months through the accounting system. She also had an H, she had several uh, HP uh, Pavilion notebooks. Uh, one of them we tracked uh, three times in four months. And then the Bun Ultra drink machine for $2,000 was transferred three times in four months. And, uh, you know, Charlene, do you have an idea of why she would transfer them so many times? Um, was somebody reconciling the accounts and uh, she knew when they were going to get reconciled? That's exactly what it was. She knew when all the accounts would be reconciled, and what she'd do is transfer from one account to another to hide what she was doing, and then she would finally park the, the – the last time she would transfer would be right after a year-end reconciliation was done at the account. And so she'd charge it in knowing that nobody was going to come back and look at that account for another year. And, you know, there was your cost transfers. But because of audit systems within the university, we were able to track all these charges throughout the accounting system and show the manip how she manipulated the accounting system to try to hide what she was doing. We also talked about fake receipts. Uh, here is a receipt. This is a real receipt we found in the purchase card statements. Uh, this was a $1,300 payment to PayPal, and it said it was for bioengineering hardcover books. Now, Charlene, is there an idea why you think they would purchase uh, bioengineering books for $1,300? No, and certainly not through PayPal. And also, how many times have you seen you know, books purchased, hardcover books purchased, that ended in a round dollar figure? Somebody should have said, well, this isn't quite right, but she was a trusted employee. Well, when we tracked this $1,300 payment, this is what we really found, a Yamaha Wave Runner. So she was certainly doing her job to conceal what she was actually doing. Um, that was quite an amazing thing. Now, the accountant decided that she wasn't going to talk to us. She never told us that. She just refused to answer our phone calls. We went out to her house. She refused to answer her door. So being out of Arlington, Virginia, um, and this case was being done in Atlanta, 
I went to the Atlanta, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I asked for the assistant from the FBI white collar crime section. And we did a search warrant at the home, and the search warrant was named Operation Scavenger Hunt. We went in and found five flat screen TVs, five computers, five digital cameras, um, multimedia player, the lawnmower, bun frozen drink machine. Uh, in the end, of course, with all that evidence, the uh, accountant pled guilty to 22 accounts of a uh, 22 count federal indictment, pled guilty to all counts, asked for forgiveness, asked for assistance. She was sentenced to 32 months in prison and ordered to pay $316 of restitution. Now, that was quite a bit, and she actually pled guilty first. Yet the program coordinator that, st- that stole less money, only 170000 was charged in state court after after the accountant pled guilty in federal court. And she came in in front of the judge to plead guilty, but then she withdrew her, her guilty plea, stating that she was coerced because of all the publicity that took place with these cases. And a week later came back in and went uh, again pled guilty um, under what's called a non-negotiated plea. And the judge was so angry at her because... She read a statement at the at the sentencing hearing that compared herself to Michael Vick, the former Atlanta quarterback, and to the rapper T.I., both personnel, uh, public persons in Atlanta that were sentenced to prison, and she compared herself to those two individuals. Well, the judge said, excuse me, lady, you just don't get it. You stole an obscene amount of money. You're not a personality. And, and then he sentenced her to 10 years in prison. Wow. So it it doesn't pay to um, upset a judge. Um, I think, it, is this where we want to ha- take some questions, Charlene? Um, yeah, well, let me just briefly talk about this because there's a couple of slides and we'll wrap it up with questions. Okay. Um, if that's okay, because one thing we'll, and this one I'm just going to briefly go over because this is just to illustrate that where how these schemes are detected. And most of the scene we saw today is that we have a tip. We have someone coming forward. So it could be your employees, but almost half the cases that are found are that we have some someone coming forward, a vendor, or someone's trying to say, hey, there's some issue going on. And so this is for our audience to have, for just a, to look through to say, um, you know, how, how do things get found out? How can we... Can we look at that? And you can see audit is down, internal audit's there, but it's only 15%. So we want to make sure we set up those mechanisms to be able to get the tips from our employees and our vendors. Now, one thing to keep in mind, Charlene, back with that um, that sli- previous slide, is that um, this was done by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, which both Charlene and I are certified fraud examiners. And this is done about economic crime throughout the whole country. And... Uh, uh, Charlene and I were talking about this, and we think it's actually very similar at our university community that we see a similar kind of thing. And one of the things that I always like to point out is, is by accident, the fourth thing down. And often the, some of the best cases I've had, and Clinchy was one of them, was the fact that it was discovered by accident. He made a mistake. He and by making a mistake, the duplicate travel came out, and uh, it was only one. It was because a hotel tried to return a a hotel payment back to Tennessee State University, and they said, well, we didn't pay you. We paid the individual directly, and they said, oh, well, we made a mistake, and then they saw that the payment actually came from the superintendent's school and not from him directly. And that led them to check and identify the the uh, duplicate payment. So by accident is something that often uncovers. In fact, a lot of time tips come from accidents. Amazing. Okay, Paul. So let's go ahead and now before we get to the last slide and wrap okay. up and take questions. And I think uh, is there there is a mechanism to call in for questions? 
Uh, that, that's right. Uh, if you do have a question for Paul or, or Charlene, just press star one on your phone's touchtone keypad, star and then the number one. This will place you into our phone queue. And then when your turn comes up, I'll introduce you by city and the first name of the person who registered at your location. Uh, so again, if you have a question or a comment and you want to ask it via the telephone, press star one now. To submit a written question or comment, please uh, click on the general chat tab near the bottom of your screen, type your question in the uh, text box at the very bottom of the screen, and then press enter or click the send button to submit your question. And uh, while we're waiting for uh, any callers to enter the queue, uh, perhaps we can uh, address uh, one of those written questions that uh, was submitted regarding whistleblower protection. And Charlene or, or Paul? Um, okay, what was the question about whistleblower? Uh, yes. Uh, it, yeah, I, the question was that uh, discovery by tips, is there whistleblower protection? So they're asking, is there a federal proposal for stronger whistleblower protection? Um, a lot of times whistleblower protection is only if it, if it includes um, uh, certain federal statutes um, like the Recovery Act funds included a whistleblower protection. However, most of the whistleblower protection comes from state statutes. And so every time you have a whistleblower, you know, we have to look at what the statutes are for the state and plus what, uh, what kind of federal program it's associated with. So it's not, uh, whistleblower is not always the easiest thing to, to deal with. And let's uh, go to the phones. Uh, let's go to Boulder, uh, Colorado, to Beth's location. Go ahead, please. Hello. This is um, Beth Kruger from Boulder, Colorado, and we have a question related to a PI who has multiple projects that are closely related, and how can we help prevent double dipping in those situations? Uh, first question I have for you, uh, are you guys a federal demonstration project? Which it, No. It, okay. Um, well, you know what, it's a different, um, e there is different rules for I uh, institutions that are uh, federal demonstration projects than there are for um, uh, non-FDP. Uh, Universities. Now, if you're, you know, either way, the best thing to do is if you see that there's a lot of related activity, is to watch closely, but then make sure that you coordinate with the funding agencies so they understand what project is being funded by what, by, on which project. You know, so they understand that there's, there's a potential for other, other problems and for relatedness. Um, and, of course, you have to go back to the PI and have him spell out how is this related to, how is this expenditure related to your project. Right. And let me add to that, Paul. I think we want to be aware of lots of cost transfers. That would be a red flag. When we start seeing funds move around from project to project, especially if they have different times that they're starting and stopping, and we have one that's ending that has funds unspent. I think those are the red flags that we want to make sure that, uh, you know that that we look at very closely. That's absolutely true. In fact, Charlene, I think you have that um, on your uh, identifying risk area slides that um, we should probably go over quickly too before we finish. And yeah. just a reminder: if you if you do have a question and you want to ask it via the telephone, press star one on your phone's touchtone keypad. If you want to just submit your question using the uh, software, just click on that general chat tab and submit your question. We do have a few minutes remaining, uh, so at this time, uh, Paul and, and Charlene, I'll turn to you for perhaps some additional information here. Okay, great. And so, and just to talk about the last bullet on our slide, what we're seeing in the audits, more of the audit findings, are issues they have with those cost transfers at the end of the grant, especially buying, we're buying equipment, we're buying computers at the end of the grant. Remember, it has to be, it has to be uh, beneficial to the program that we're on. And so that's, as you get later and later in the grant starting to end and wind down, it's harder to make the case that it was critical to the project. And so that's where we want to look. And that's where they look in the audit. So they look in the audit guides. They'll look through and look to see what those expenses were at those last weeks of the grant. So we want to make sure we run the run rate reports, the expenditure reports. We, keep, we kind of track 
what's going on. Um, some of the other risk areas are tone at the top. We can kind of see, I think, when we went through this, you can kind of guess the institutions that really had a tone of maybe looking the other way more, may have had more frauds, and those that really were trying to um, monitor and combat. But that's, you know, that's going to be an issue is it, at your institution so, to see uh, what, what makes it more difficult or not to kind of, you know, or easier to circumvent is how we look. Actually, the tone at the top, I think, is very important. I've noticed when I've gone into some institutions, and I will say this right up front, Georgia Tech, um, I've worked there quite a bit, and they are great. Their tone at the top is, hey, we won't tolerate any of this. You know, if you've done something wrong, we're going to help whoever it is investigate it and go after whatever, and we won't have employees that, that break the law. And so if you've got a strong uh, tone at the top of non-tolerance for uh, shenanigans, then, you know, you're gonna, it's going to be easy for you to take action. When you've got a tone at the top that looks the other way, you know, that means things can happen and people are going to abuse that. And one thing you need to uh, risk area would be is look at, especially on your pro cards, who has the approval authority and do subordinates have approval? Um, and that may be an issue, especially with the purchasing cards. We had cases here where, at FIU, where the uh, PI had the purchasing card, and the approver was a subordinate, a trusted subordinate. And uh, so a lot of times what happened is the person would, the trusted subordinate would be making purchases on behalf of the PI as well as approving the transaction. So we want to make sure that no one person has all the authority or is in a position where they have someone, a supervisor, that can um, request that they approve a purchase that they don't feel comfortable with. Um, the other thing is we'll look at these conflict of interest situations. A lot of the, the uh, interaction we saw with the private companies were really conflict of interest situations. We, the ownership of these private companies are doing business with, with the institution. So those will be a red flag, something you may want to look at more closely. Um, and then you want to make sure and sure you have a way to handle employee concerns of fraud and abuse. So it's important to have a hotline or some other mechanism. As we saw from the chart of this on the last slide, that almost half of all these tips coming in are from employees, from vendors. So we want a way that they can actually tell the institution when they think there's an issue. Um, and Charlene, I think that, I've always called those the X's. The ex-wives, the ex-girlfriends, the ex-postdoc, the ex-grad student, somebody that knows what's going on and they would really like, and they have a reason to submit the, the, the complaint or allegation. And uh, it's always nice when they have an opportunity to do that. So. And we're down to the final minute. Any additional information, uh, Charlene or Paul? We do have uh, your contact information on the screen. If anyone has additional questions, uh, they can reach out to, to either of you. No, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. This has been fun, and I've hoped you've enjoyed it, and we'll go back and gain some knowledge you can use your institution. And if there's any questions, feel free to call. And uh, I'd like to thank Charlene for uh, uh, doing just an awful lot of work that she's done to help uh, organize this and set it up. I appreciate all of her hard work. Ah, uh, thanks, Paul. It's always a joy working with you. All and right. thanks to both of you. That does conclude our program. Embezzlement, false claims, theft and bribery, NSF, OIG investigated cases your institution needs to know about, sponsored by Incura and presented by Paul Coleman and Charlene Blevins. Now, in just a moment, you will have access to an online program evaluation. Please take a moment to fill it out. Your feedback will help us to continue to bring you future quality programming. You must fill out the evaluation in order to receive CEU credit for today's activity. Today's program is copyrighted in 2013, National Council of University Research Administrators, all rights reserved.